Hello, my name is Ryan Rumsey, and this is episode 206 of the Service Design Show. Most design professionals think that they need to prove their value with hard metrics. Our guest today says that they are looking in the wrong place. He's here to reveal why the real secret to design success might be something you already know, but haven't fully embraced. Hey, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push businesses forward. So today we are joined by a returning guest, Ryan Ramsey. Ryan is a seasoned design leader who's anything but conventional. He's not just a designer, but a small business owner author of two insightful books, including Business Thinking for Designers, which I highly recommend. And he's a passionate advocate for individual empowerment. You might also be surprised to learn that this calm, collected expert is also a former burlesque dancer and covered in tattoos. Ryan is a testament to the fact that there is no single and his unconventional path has led him to insights that he's eager to share with us. If you're wrestling with questions of ROI, struggling to prove design's worth with hard numbers, or wondering if your company truly needs you, Ryan has a refreshing perspective. Maybe the answer isn't in stricter metrics, or chasing elusive causality, but in embracing the reality of correlations, celebrating your unique contributions, and finding fulfillment in the work itself. So in today's conversation, you'll learn about why the traditional KPI tree model, practical ways to incorporate statistical thinking strategies to link your day-to-day -day activities to the company's bottom line, how to navigate the complex world of variables and uncover meaning correlations between your design efforts and business outcomes, and the invaluable role you play in design. I love chatting with Ryan as he always brings some very interesting opinions. In our conversation, he makes a point that I know will sound controversial to some designers. Most businesses don't actually need great. Now, whether you agree or disagree, it's a conversation I think we need to be having. I'm curious how you will feel about this. Please join me for another great conversation with Ryan Rumsey, and I'll catch you at the end. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening. Welcome back to the show, Ryan. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me back. It feels like a small reunion on the show. We've had some former guests on in the past episodes. You've also starred on the show before, so this is the sequel. And I always ask the trick question, if you actually recall when it was that you were on the show. Uh, I do recall... It was, I'm going to say 2021, uh, and it was prob probably the spring of 2021. February, so, yeah. Okay, February. So my birthday month of 2021, we were still living in Austin, Texas, and uh, we were just about to visit Vermont uh, pre in the middle of the pandemic still, and find our next uh home and and so yes it was uh, it was 2021 right so three something three years, years ago. yeah three yeah. plus years did you eventually move to vermont we did uh we moved in july of 2021 and we found ourselves living uh in inside an eco co-housing community um in rural vermont 
We, uh, for those who don't know where Vermont is, we're, we're sort of right between Boston and Montreal uh, on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, this area is called New England, and uh, we live in a very small town, uh, lots of agriculture land, uh, and this little co-housing community that we live in is is focused really on sustainability. There's 22 households. We all live in, in individual places, but we co-own about 260 acres of land. The majority of that is is forest land, but there's a, a good percentage that is agricultural. Um, my neighbors have a dairy farm, and so we we essentially lease back the the farm buildings and and the agriculture land to them for free. And so when I need to, I can I can go pet cows. I can go shovel poop if I'm really up for it. And it's yeah, it's been a good transition. Scenery, a, a little bit different scenery compared to South by Southwest, I guess. Um. <laughs> yeah, very different uh, from Texas. Lots of trees, lots of uh, green. Um, yeah, lots of winter sports. <laughs> From uh, petting cows and shoveling uh, poop, Ryan, uh, this brings us to our topic of today. Um, and this was inspired by a post that I shared on LinkedIn where I went a bit off on a rant and said that there is something inherently broken with key performance indicator trees um, and that I feel that they are standing in the way of doing good service design work. And I don't recall your exact comment, but uh, it could have been somewhat in the realm of "so what." Uh, <laughs> so take me, take me, take me to the moment that you were reading that post, and uh, let's geek out on value measurement, objectives, and all the stuff that's related. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I geeked out on it. I'm not sure I said "so what." I think I said <laughs> something like this. Because if I recall your post, you were saying there's something wrong here. Uh, it's not it, that KPIs are wrong. It's more the, uh, it seemed like, and, and maybe I'm projecting, but it, and if I recall, it seemed like you were saying the way KPIs are maybe taught or introduced is is not really how things get done or even how you you think about measuring. And uh, I, if I recall your post, you were saying something like, it should be different. The, this tree doesn't seem to be working. And I just, I said something like this. And I showed you a picture of, of stuff that I've done over the years of, it's more like a web. And where you know we can get into this, but but I, I I very much agree with you in that the very popularized version of KPI trees or OKRs or whatever you say the the pyramidal structure makes sense conceptually, uh, but I think that very basic structure makes it very hard for people to uh, meet reality with that or to develop things or to learn it, it, it it's it, I you know I don't know where you want to go with this or how nerdy you want to, to go we, we want to go into this all, all know, out but, nerdy yeah <laughs> yeah but but I when I see these tree structures or or let's just take okrs for an example is the methodology basically says there's one objective uh, for a company and then a team will have an objective and then you have key results. And so KPIs, key performance indicators, they're you know essentially the same as key results in OKRs. And that, that makes sense. But uh, does everybody have more than one objective that they're trying to hit, really? Of course, you're you're trying to be more efficient with your team. You're trying to improve satisfaction. You're trying to reduce an error. You're trying to 
uh, have good collaboration. You're trying to have fewer meetings. Like those are all objectives that we are faced with every day, and you kind of lose sight because you go, "Well, I hear you, person, saying that we should all align to one objective, but I'm I'm facing a very different reality." And I I think one of the things that I see time and time again is everybody rushes to the end and says, what's the right metric? What are the right metrics? And I, I think we even been talked about this before, that, that that's a perfectly legitimate question. But the problem is that I see is it's the last question we should answer because we don't know what two different objectives have to do with each other. We don't understand or can't see in that pyramidal shape what do these objectives have in common? What's the relationship between them? And because we can't see that with this pyramidal shape, we end up thinking more in this zero sum of arguments of, no, it should be velocity, or it should be fewer meetings, or it should be accessibility. We don't see more that they are in relation to each other, that they are intrinsically intertwined with each other. And I think in a weird way, it's because most of us aren't thinking even statistically. <laughs> like, you know, if you're you're getting into metrics, you're more concerned with the relationship of variables to each other, not just one by itself. So uh, that's a weird segue, but maybe that helps us get into it. Well, yes, statistics, of course, uh, we'll get into that. And what you're saying, the way I'm translating this, or where this is coming from from my end is, of course, I'm hearing a lot of service design professionals struggle to articulate the value that they are um, contributing. Um, they see that they are moving things, but it's impacting across different teams across different silos and sort of improving customer experience and thinking holistically about a journey requires to measure a system and to observe the performance of a system rather than its individual parts and my, my sort of my my tension there was like if we're just focused on measuring the individual parts we'll never be able to uh, come out with a more effective system. So there is a tension between measurement, the way it's done now in the old school assembly line, factory model, division of labor kind of thing, and you're responsible for this small chunk versus we actually, as a company, as a team, as an organization, want to deliver something and deliver that uh, at a certain level. And I think we, like you said, we need to think about measurement in a different way and visualizing measurement. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm going to maybe push back yes. a little bit in saying that the, if again, we're thinking kind of statistically. So if you think of something like correlation, just simply looking at the relationship between two variables. Uh, there are a lot of great data analysts, data scientists, and, and, and whatnot. But in my experience, companies, when they are putting measures or, or systems of performance in place, there aren't a lot of business units. You know, So if we're talking service design, that's generally at a place that has more than one product uh, or service, more than one business unit. Tell me a company where two different business, or even if you call them general managers, where they share measures, where they have shared outcomes. It's it's not really the case. Not in the in the companies that are organized as different business units. They're very much treated as separate entities. Uh, Apple is very different here. Apple is not organized in that way, and so. Here we have this conundrum of service designers trying to or being asked to build across an ecosystem that really 
the different parts of this ecosystem are are not they're not making any decisions in that way. They're not even uh, evaluating their own stuff in that way. And the little pushback that I want to give you is to understand a system is to, or, or, or even in measurement, is to know that there are individual parts. And rather than thinking about we shouldn't measure the individual parts, it's that next step, again, thinking more like a statistician of you saying, no, our our goal is to understand the relationship between parts. And so it becomes, you know, more like an if then statement, which is to say, if we increase the alt tags, we believe that will reduce errors. And if we reduce errors, that we should uh, improve our velocity because we're not spending so much time redoing work. And if we improve our velocity, that might, uh, enable us to deploy more often. And if we deploy more often, you know, and it becomes this more building and building. And the thing that I often come to teams with is OKRs, KPIs, the models themselves really focus on just kind of the objective and metric part. But there's no real cohesion of really defining kind of health in general. Mm -hmm. So there's like a weird, uh, 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 there's, a, uh, there's a model that predates KPIs called the balanced scorecard method that's been taught to business people for a long time. And it was really for this, this more waterfall approach. And so it's just this giant kind of unwieldy, you know, map, but there's, a method within that called strategy mapping. And even the authors uh, wrote a second book that was just about strategy mapping. And what they do there, which is quite clever, is they just provide what they call perspectives or categories of health, which they call in the traditional business sense, learning, operations, customer, financial. And so they're basically saying there are objectives that we want to put in place to help our team learn and grow a skill. Because if we do that, that will help us operate more efficiently and effectively. And, you know, and if we do that, that will allow us to increase customer value. And if we do that, that will help us either reduce costs or, or create revenue. What those are made for, those categories, are largely around measures that people who work on products and services can't influence directly. Can you give an example? MRR, uh, monthly NPS. Recurring revenue. Yeah, yes. uh, monthly reoccurring revenue, NPS, CSAT. Mm -hmm. Where I see so many teams struggling is this desire to say, oh, CSAT is a measure of customer experience. And I'm saying, that's fine. If you want to put it into customer experience, that's fine. But the people who are working on services and products, they can't influence that measure directly. Meaning the work that they do leads to something later, which might show up as CSAT. And what I would argue is that CSAT is just one of these traditional customer business health metrics. And I think when I when I talk to folks, there's not really the equivalent of these categories of health for the actual making of a product or defining a product mm. in terms of like quality and what it needs it to do. And so lots of teams end up uh, uh, throwing up their best practice or their or their preferred method, but there aren't a lot of teams that say like, we know this product or service here in this environment that we are in is good here because this is the behavior that translates to something. And yeah, I, I feel like I'm going in a weird rabbit hole now, but it, but it's this conversation that, uh, 
we want to look at the entire system and this ecosystem, but it's incredibly to do so when the parts of the system have never had a conversation of like what is good for the system uh, uh, in that way. And, and, and so if that's not defined or even a flag planted in the ground for a service designer or a researcher, we don't know what we're trying to really catalyze. We can only stick to the vague, uh, it's better, it's, it's more this, because there's no agreement, say, between two different services of what they share in common and, and, and what, what these larger journeys, what's, what, what we should see out of the system. I, I'm going in a weird yes. rabbit hole. Now, no, so I'll, I want to let you go. <laughs> that's, that's the purpose of this episode. But I, I want to uh, clinch on for something you said and uh, explore that because let's take something like monthly recurring revenue. Um, I know service design professionals or designers in general would love to sort of be able to attribute part of the work towards that specific goal because that's tangible, that gets measured. And then you can say, you know, you see, here's how I'm um, sort of justifying my salary. The problem is that there is like a black box between, okay, here are the activities that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I can show you um, my effort, my, my actions and what that has led to qualitatively or even quantitatively if you want to measure the number of user research interviews that you've done but then there is like almost no way to tie that back into something that matters to people who are making financial decisions and i see you're I laughing disagree. so so i'm pushing the right buttons nice. i disagree uh again if you think like a statistician, what does that mean? The way, well, a status, like just look at this. Uh, so correlation and linear regression, these are like fundamental uh, uh, ways that data anal analysts or, or statisticians think. And so what I hear a lot from say designers, service designers, researchers is, is there's this big black box. I do these activities and I can measure something, but there is no way to show that it does anything. And so I think there's a couple things going on. One, everyone wants causation. And we don't even get curious about correlation. And I think in business, this is maybe a little bit controversial. I think at best, most the closest you can get to causation is just a bunch of correlation. That in the end, like you would have to be so, so data mature, so data mature in your tooling, in your analysis, that you could actually separate experiments off by one variable at a time. And there are a few companies that could do that. But when you're talking at these big systems, I think the blocker for most teams is this, that of what you're really leaning into is you can absolutely mark, say, measure the amount of interviews you do in a month. That's a variable. Measure that for six consecutive months and put that side by side with MRR, monthly reoccurring revenue for six consecutive months. And you're running a correlation analysis that basically says, is there any relationship between the number of interviews that I run and monthly reoccurring revenue? Now that feels very far away, but from a mathematical standpoint, you could absolutely just see if there's a relationship. And what the reality is that I know is that is step one to just a very long process to say, oh, if there is a correlation, I wonder what else I can measure within that. So I've done four, on average, four interviews a month. Uh, 
I've also noticed that each time we interview, is there a relationship to an error rate? Is there a relationship to other things? And when you start thinking more that way, what you're looking for are patterns in correlation. It seems like this action relates to that, that action relates to this. And mathematically, it's, it's pretty easy to start showing that. I think the hard part for most people is the human side because they always ha they will always come and say, well, now I have to convince somebody that that's a bread I mean, a breadcrumb trail we should follow. Uh, I have to sit in a room and say, oh, there's this interesting relationship that I see here. And somebody across the room from me is going to say, so what? How do you know? I don't believe you. And that's that's not a that's not a math problem to solve. That's not even a stats problem to solve. Now we're talking about human relationship. And so I think generally what happens is <laughs> people want an answer. People want to feel like they have an impact right now. They want that meaning. And I totally understand that. And once they see the realities of like, this is going to take a long time and this is going to take a long effort to convince people and more people and more people and more people. As soon as that becomes this reality, you're almost exhausted before you even begin. And, and those things are possible, but I think there's this reality that it's, it's just a lot of correlation and you know how comfortable we are we with like leaning into it's just better guessing <laughs> there's there's you know uh, uh, this and so i i want to hear from you but but like all of this is possible yes and i feel that people know this intuitively so you you somehow deep down know that the work that you're doing is contributing to the end cause it the thing that I'm hearing is there are so many variables that it's really hard. To, you know, <laughs> it's really hard yeah. to pinpoint. Like uh, the interviews, like doing interviews, user research interviews might be one thing, but I don't know. The weather outside could be another thing. Like, and then creating these correlations, uh, like you said, if you have enough data and if you, if the time span is long enough, yeah, you could do that. The question is, most organizations, like they're not that invested yet to have these measurement systems in place. So they're just doing almost blind bets. And then people, yeah, struggle to, 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 show, to show their value and to measure the effect of their work. I, I don't know that people are going to like what I have to say right now. Um. I think everybody should deserve to feel, deserves to feel, not should deserve, deserves to feel that meaning that somehow the work that they are doing and that hard work has meaning. Right? We should all have that. And I think, you know, when you were talking about, I think in the back of our heads, we all know this. I think the same could be said that, that we know that there are plenty of companies out there that can make lots and lots of money without having to do this rigor. And it becomes, as I've experienced it and how others have shared it with me, it becomes this really like almost internal philosophical debate, this acknowledgement. Like I often joke, you know, designers, you might not really want to know how business works because there's this realization that many companies choose to make their profit in a manner that isn't about the highest quality service, isn't about the highest quality product. If you've ever flown EasyJet, right? That's not, that's not how the profit is made. And like, if we really sit with that, that's, that's 
really hard. I think for a lot of service designers and designers, they're driven by making quality things. And and uh, a thing that I hear so often from this is like, we should be doing this. Or they hear a company saying, we want you to create world-class X. But in reality, the mechanisms of how that company maybe makes money is is not about that. Um, and how do, for me, how do we find out? That, yeah. How do we find out? How, well, how do you find out? Well, uh, do you know whether you are working in the profit arm of a company or the cost arm of a company? For one. If, if we want to take examples, how does Google make their money? Selling attention. The majority of their yeah. money. At advertising, I, I don't know what the number now, but, but but I still think it's still about eighty five percent of their money. Well, they have all sorts of services and 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 whatnot that are great, that are valuable. But most of Google is is on the cost side of the profit tree. And so when you talk about that. And that drive is Google, you know, I, I, I'm not an exec making these decisions at Google, but it's still, if you think about the spreadsheet side of things, if you're not creating profit and you're on the cost side, most of, the, you know, uh, of that mechanism is not to create the world's best something. It's to create something to their best that is within <laughs> the costs that they want to the risk and manage. You can Google most, you know, like if you work for a company, you can literally go on the web and say, how does this company make money? And the majority of companies out there are not choosing to make profit through the best service or product in the world. So what's the implication? And I believe that you're absolutely right. The implication is maybe the reality of how that company chooses to make money uh, and it might be different than what they tell an employee or what they tell somebody. And it's it's great to tell somebody that we're, we're focused on making the world's best thing. Uh, that's very inspiring, and I think that that works well to to recruit and and hire folks. But but you know, let's talk about designers and service designers, and and you know, we're obviously in this very difficult macroeconomic moment right now. Um, but for you know, ten fifteen years, when you as a designer were at a company where you started to see like, oh, this company isn't really trying to do what I thought that they were wanting to do. Well, I imagine that it was quite easy to see another company that was <laughs> recruiting or attracting or, or wanting you and selling you on the same thing. And I, I, you know, this is maybe a question for those listening. Did it, did it, feel somewhat similar you went to this new company all energized and then you're starting to feel the same things like maybe they don't also want the same things and so, so this pattern that i saw is repeating where uh people realized uh in some way that maybe this company that i'm working at and i'm not saying it's the case for everybody but it doesn't maybe match the reality of what i thought and that's where it's like this. I'll jokingly say, we bring our philo uh, you know, philosophy debates to an accounting meeting, and it's really hard to be exposed to that accounting meeting sometimes. And there's this dilemma because we might be driven, and we might very much from a, an ethical and values standpoint say we we believe that these are the types of products and services that belong in the world i believe that too 
And that might run against what an organization or company believes or their interpretation of that, which is like, oh, <laughs> uh, we're here to also make money. Uh, uh, and so, yeah. It would be really interesting to put more design professionals into accounting meetings for sure. Um, the, the thing is, obviously, obviously these two things are not mutually exclusive. Like I think there are some companies out there who have proven that doing great design is one of the most profitable things you can do. So like it, it, from that perspective, yes. you'd say like, bring it on. If you were to start a company, yeah. But there are, I'm, I'm going to argue this. There are more companies, this is anecdotal, this is hot vibes. I would argue there are more companies who make a lot of money and they choose not to do that. So, uh, you know, what's, so, you know, it, there's an example of say, you know, name your company. What's, what's a company that's a good example for you that, that does that? To, uh, that, that has put design front and center. Yes. Uh, let, yeah. Let's take so, the obvious one. Let's take, let's take Apple. Like Apple has chosen to do that. You're right. They choose to make their profit. The way that they make their money is through superior product and services. That is a choice. Uh, Dell is in a similar industry. Is that how Dell chooses to make their money? Is Dell as valuable as Apple? No. But does Dell do pretty well? And are there a lot of people who love a Dell and love a PC? Absolutely. Dell, uh, you know, uh, largely focused on supply chain, superior supply chain. But there's, there's a question for you here, because if we're talking about service design or, or product design, uh, you know, Mark, have you ever bought something or used a service because it fit your budget? Obviously, yes. Obviously, yes. Is that not human? Is that not quality for where you are and who you are? So there's like this different perception that I think we can take too, which is to say, uh, is our uh, preferred definition of quality or our preferred where we get excited most to, to work in something really in a particular way, sold in a particular way. And I think what we, you know, uh, for me, it's the case. I would prefer to work at a company like Apple that does that. Uh, but there's a whole lot of gigs out there and good work to be done at companies that that's not how they make their money. And, and so there's this wrestling, I think, that a lot of folks have where, where they're just trying to battle that internally of saying like, well, well now what is a good service or, uh, do you see what I mean? Where, where you go in and, and, and trying to have that conversation of saying like, you should do it this way. But frankly, at, at, at Dell, Dell would go bankrupt if they tried to do what Apple does. The interesting thing, and let's stick to Dell, and uh, maybe they'll become a sponsor yeah. of the show. Who knows? Uh, nice. So it's so interesting to think about the conversations that design professionals need to have in an organization like this, because they can, like, they are probably creating tons of value inside a company like Dell. Like, absolutely, no doubt about it. It's just that because it's not set up to be let's call it design driven from the start, the, the conversations are different. Um, and I think this ties back and I want to bring it to uh, the strategy map, which you introduced me to a few years ago, and I've been a fan since. Um, and if we tie it back to sort of the, the measurement aspect, <clears throat> I'll take a small detour and then come back to this point. So <clears throat> if we think about like management instead of design. 
nobody probably is measuring very hard what the contribution is of management as a discipline inside a company, inside Dell. Nobody questions it, right? The, the, the way I'm going here is I feel that we don't even need to double down on measurement. If you can, that's great. But what the thing that's mostly lacking is can we provide a believable narrative around how value is created? And I think the strategy map is a very easy tool to sort of string those things together. Like, hey, listen, I'm doing these user interviews here and that's going to trickle down into this that's going and if this all is if all of this is true then we are going to make more profit and if you want to measure that like be my guest bring in the statistician but this is how i believe that i'm contributing i feel that that's missing and for if we take management we don't even talk about that because i don't know it's common knowledge with design that's the message we need to be communicating more. Uh, yes, I, I want to add on uh, to this because I, I agree. And to me, there's... Gosh, I always feel like a Debbie Downer. That's a phrase uh, used here in the States of like somebody who shows up to a party and then immediately shares bad news. And I, I, I want to... Uh, sort of uh, ensure that I'm talking about this in a way that, that comes from a place that like, I believe in design. I believe in like the verb. I don't necessarily identify as like the noun. And there's a conversation that I hear a lot, which is, you know, you mentioned management doesn't measure their stuff. Product managers don't measure these things. You're like the other teams don't have to. And I'll say this. Can a product or a service be created and put into the world without a designer? 100%. Especially if you're talking technology. All day, every day. Designers, as I see them, like designers, the people who are deep in expertise and do this craft, our greatest asset to a company is that we are there to catalyze something that could be made. We are there to boost it. And I think where we are at right now in this time is a lot of how we did this 15, 20 years ago, we just had processes and capabilities that just nobody, nobody really had. And this reminds me of uh, the idea of perceived value. So this kind of relates to you saying, you know, we should communicate this. Is that 15, 20 years, years ago, by having these capabilities or showing completely new ways to people, we exceeded their expectations of what could be done. But now many of our practices are fairly democratized. We, we show up with everything that people expect. Oh, you have a map. Oh, we're going to use post-its. Oh, you're talking about like I've seen now so many people have now been exposed to the processes and practices now that there's no, no surprise anymore. We're not changing perceptions of what can be done, I think, in, in large part. So an executive is maybe saying, oh, I've seen this before. Why should I expect anything new out of this? And you're right. It is this communication. And this kind of goes back to, we're now getting to the hard part where I think a lot of service designers, researchers, product designers, everybody in this sort of area of catalyzing where they've experienced quite often 
and maybe quite a bunch of times, somebody saying, I don't believe you. Somebody being a skeptic. And that's when I'd say, okay, now that's where a lot of this is hitting. It's not a matter of the mapping. It's not a matter of showing is that when I show this to people, there's probably going to be a bunch of people who still doubt it, mm -hmm. who aren't convinced. Mm -hmm. But there's always going to be somebody who, who is. And I suppose it is a narrative. And when I think about this narrative, this never-ending narrative that we have to convince somebody, that we have to tell them that this is something, that we have to justify our own work, there's this disadvantage that things can be done technically without us. And uh, what I'm just noticing is that if I keep showing somebody the same things over and over again, and they have not been convinced yet, showing them the same thing over again is an argument that I've, I've just seen hasn't worked. And so I think for a lot of folks who are in this, in this work, it's kind of like if, if you keep showing people a service map or, or front and back end, if you keep using the same techniques that, that are, have meaning and importance to you, and that is not convincing somebody, that's just data that says that's, that's a different, that's a narrative that is not working in the way that you hope. And you're right. I think some of these maps might convince new people and they might not. There's no guarantee. But it's a good, good option to try something new. And trying something new. And this is like, um, like there are multiple routes we can take here. So I like uh, the provocation that you said, that you mentioned where, uh, yes, you can do this work without me. Um, that might be a statement just to put out there and then throw up your hands in the air. Yeah. So go ahead. Like if you, if you don't think I'm adding value here or you're not seeing the value that I'm adding here, like why are we having this conversation? That's, that's sort of the pretty blunt route, but could be pretty effective. The other thing that I'm hearing you say is like, okay, uh, you're not bringing anything new, but my answer to that would be like management isn't bringing anything new either. And I'm going to go, uh, Mark, if we sit in that place where somebody else isn't doing it either, uh, you're seeding your agency. You are m wanting the change to be outside of you. And what I would say is you are absolutely right. Management isn't doing that either. But I want to feel better for me. I want to be in a position where I'm doing better work. And if I'm waiting for somebody else to give me that opportunity that they've never given me yet, I, I'm just going to go, the data is probably going to say that that's not going to happen. And so in many ways, you're right. There's this interesting thing of communicating that... Uh, I like to remix uh, Barbara Minto's pyramid principle. So it's a structure that's been used in management consulting for a long time. And if you're an outside consultant, you're usually paid a lot of money to give somebody the one answer. But if you work in-house and you're trying to develop some type of relationship uh, and build trust with somebody, you usually can't just give one answer to people. But one of my favorite answers to give people is something like this. You know, if I'm working with a manager or an executive and they say, I'm worried about uh, NPS, is for me to just say, like, I hear you. You're worried about NPS. I know that has meaning for you. You've been talking about it for six months. And then say, well, we've tried everything we knew. We've tried to address this as many ways that we could, and it has not changed. Our whole backlog for the next 12 months is based on the assumption that it would have changed, and it has not changed. So, option one, 
I am happy to do the exact same thing that we've been doing. But I don't think anything will change. Option two, uh, uh, we'll stay on budget and schedule, but we're going to do totally new things. And we don't know what we're going to get, but at least we're trying something new. And, and that conversation for me is just sort of, I think of it more as like an invitation mm -hmm. for the manager to try something new. Because if I say I'm willing to do the same thing, that's showing them I'm I'm willing to be a team player or whatever they want to call it. And if they say, just keep doing it and they expect something new, well, that's me looking inwards and saying like, I've done a good job of, of representing myself. <laughs> I don't have to adult for this other person. Now I just know that this, this is somebody who doesn't want to change. Uh, that's a different conversation, but at least I'm now trying to say I'm taking an active role in seeing if there's a new opportunity for me to try to do my best work rather than just waiting for the manager to, to show up one day and say, you know, Mark, I think I've finally realized that, uh, you should be doing things in the way that you want. Mm. Generally it doesn't happen that way. The interesting thing about this approach is that you have to actively go out and seek out opportunities worth solving. So you have to find things that aren't working right now and where people are interested and open to try new things, at least in the beginning. If mm -hmm. because like you said, you know, if EasyJet like EasyJet works, I, I, I'm going to assume that they are making a profit. Um, that that's going to be a hard bargain to convince somebody to take a different approach towards the way they do stuff. Yes, and so it becomes a conversation. Uh, look, I I I'm I sit in a place where I've had tremendous privilege and and access and. You know, I, I can say these things. I don't have the experience that a lot of others have. Uh, you know, I'm a man, I'm a white man in tech. Like I, I, I can, you know, uh, I just have a, the benefit of, of everything. I, I have the easiest route. And, and when we talk, so if we use this easy jet example for me, I would then say, Am I okay working at a place where there's maybe good people, good colleagues, I get paid well, I have good benefits, I enjoy the work actually, but this is a place where maybe I don't get to do these breakthrough wonderful things that I want to do. Now I have a trade-off decision. What matters more to me? Is it having this good job, good relationships? We all kind of get along and, and I get to have my weekends off and be with my family and, and that's a good life? Or am I driven in a way that, that I have to just go work on, on things in, it, in, in that way? Like that's what drives me. And, and that's, that's a difficult conversation for any adult any of us to get through is to really, uh, this is a weird segue, but it's like, I want everybody to, to know that their needs are important too. And that's often a conversation of saying like, well, does this trade-off work for me? Because it doesn't, it's your life. It, it's, it's what you go home with. And, and, Nobody gets to define for you what, what is good or what isn't good. Uh, and that's, that's where I feel like design is particularly, as an industry, we're hard on each other. There's like this, hmm. there's this uh, lifestyle or this um, ambiance we have to portray of, uh, of living a, a certain way or, or doing certain work where 
if we just look pragmatically at it, um, it's, it's, it's fine. And it affords us a life. And now there's so many of us that get to do this work day by day. Um, and if you are so driven to do something else, you, you, you find that maybe in other areas. I mean, look, mm -hmm. I live on an eco co-housing farm community. And so it's me choosing to find that uh, connection and value to something outside of maybe working for a corporation. I, I didn't expect our conversation to go this way, but maybe this is a, <clears throat> a reminder, a call to action to our uh, entire community to sort of reevaluate what uh, what we've, well, I, I don't know if, if, what good looks like, but the, um, uh, are we putting too much pressure on ourselves and, um, like, would it, would it just be better for everybody if we take a breath and sort of realize that we can't be in the optimal situation? all the time and that sometimes it is a grind that it takes a long time and you might never get to a situation where you're fully happy but that's still okay and celebrate that sort of thing well i i i think there is a lot of pressure and uh there's a weird little segue but uh, i'm collaborating uh, with somebody right now, uh, uh, an editor to kind of like help me with my, my own writing and stuff. And, uh, they asked me a question, which is like, are you, are you trying to help the industry or are you trying to help individual people? And I, th I'd say I'm the latter, which is so much of the conversation is, is really around the industry, our industry, our industry. And I think we need more balance. Uh, I shouldn't say we need or you should. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. It's my belief that and where I, I work is, is more around the individual, uh, which is to say you, you're doing a good job and your definition of what good is is also okay. There's a lot of pressure to hold up to some norm and there's lovely marketing and materials that we as an industry love to create for each other. But when you talk to somebody uh, at dinner or at drinks, there's so much weight to carry to try to somehow match what Airbnb is doing or what, uh, you know, Apple is doing. And you know, if you talk to anybody at those companies inside, it's not the narrative there. And I think if we are to make progress, it, um, it's to like move forward and lean into some of these realities and, and, and find other ways uh, uh, to move forward and to remember that each of us are human and we're doing our best. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who have strong opinions around design who have kind of opted out. Mm -hmm. They've, they've chosen not to actually be part of in-house teams and work with other partners and try to do this hard thing of collaboration. And they are wonderfully good at, uh, giving a narrative of what they see. Uh, but maybe have not themselves done this sort of hard work. And, and so that's where I think our, our, you know, I don't have any prescriptions, but, but I would say I'm very pro individual pro worker and thinking about, uh, the pressures that we put on ourselves. Like if, if you are a service designer that does good work and not all your ideas and you don't change some type of mega corporation through that work, but it's good work and people are affected at the end of the day. And that work gives you uh, 
you know, a way to live a good life and then translate some of that to other parts of your life. Gosh, uh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, designer you are. That that's that's my sort of stance, and I I, I think it's the narratives and and stuff that we put our. There's a lot of pressure on yeah. us that that sort of avoids that part. <clears throat> Heading towards the uh, end of this conversation, the thing um, I want to say, and this is also going to tie in, I think, to what you're doing at the moment, is I've spoken a lot about the value of community. And with the Circle community, we now have a group of around 70 people who roll up their sleeves and do the dirty work of service design in-house. And I think having those honest, open, vulnerable conversations is probably one of the most effective ways I've seen to get over the Instagram type of um, perception that there is out there across design. So for anybody who's listening, like whether you're doing service design, copywriting, whatever, like find your community of people who who are struggling their way forward. And uh, I think that gives a much more honest uh idea of of what this work looks like and what good looks like and relieves so much pressure and it's just good to know that there are others who have the same doubts and the same questions and um yeah so <clears throat> community i strongly believe in community and i think that's also mm. where you are heading in these days right yeah it's been a large part of what i've been doing for you know five years and and I want to preface that I think for you and I both, when we say community, we don't mean a digital tool. We don't mean Slack or something like this. But what I think you're saying, you know, in our previous conversations, and what I would agree with is is a sense of belonging, uh, a space to uh, be heard, to be helped, to be hugged, like whichever variety of that you're looking for right now, but also a space where I would say people opt into. There's a there's a a weird relationship that I think a lot of uh, design folks have to this word of like collective or collaboration, where we maybe spend a lot of time trying to convince others to be collaborators, but maybe ourselves we're not leaning into that too much mm. with others uh uh and the importance i think here is uh, uh my my wife's a psychotherapist and so i'm going to sort of talk about it in this weird therapy way is is you really can't send somebody else to therapy you can't you know, if you're a, a think of this as a, a manager and you send your team to agile training and you tell them it's a requirement, they will probably go through the mechanics, but they're not in a place where they're really digging in and 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 learning and developing and and you know feeling that sense of belonging. And I think it's the same with community, which is uh to really get to that place of sharing and giving and receiving it's it's reciprocal it's not just i'm here to observe is is to actually um opt into that uh and i think what you do and what i do strangely enough is we want to make sure that people that opt into that are willing to share back they're they're willing to uh hold space for others too and you're right i i think when it's then within that space we can we can kind of get nerdy it's not just about sharing the challenges i imagine in your your community too there's lots of like energy these these uh feelings of moving forward and feeling surprise and all this stuff that i think right now a lot of people are yearning for which is gosh lots of things are so hard uh, is there a space where 
you know, maybe we could talk about that, but we're also talking about like, what is lifting us up? What is this energy? What are these types of things? And, and to me, that's, there's, um, there's this quote, I'm going to get it wrong. Uh, there's a, a, I'll send it to you in the notes, but there's a, a professor at the Kellogg School of Management at the University of Chicago who said something uh, like, Here, I'm, 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 I'm actually going to pull it up. I'm going to read it to you because I think yes. it's very yes. good, which is uh, when you think about community, I have it right here. So I'm literally going to read, which is saying, what precedes a hot streak in creativity and innovation is sampling. Sampling from other genres, sampling from other areas of knowledge, sampling from other different perspectives. And so I think when people opt in and are willing to kind of give and receive and hold space, what they're really doing is uh, uh, being in a good place where they are sampling with each other. And so that's where I think, if anything, for service designers, product designers, even uh, you know my my audience or people who move into management is just being in environments where you're you're seeing this sampling, you're seeing these remixing, you're seeing these things that maybe you didn't think, and and that's the beauty of these little maps that I create is they are the language of designers and service designers, but they're introducing something like statistics or communication and just a in their preferred language and so it's so much to try to create this new energy around something new because we, we all need that energy we all deserve that energy ryan um we went from hugging cows to measurement frameworks to community if somebody made it all the way and is still here with us what do you hope is the one thing dale remember from our conversation i i think that they will probably already know but i i would say understanding that that this is the real thing this is how real discovery happens the the ability to kind of move in and out and build upon one each other is is the same of how good things are made good services are made and I, I would just like them to remember that that their needs are part of the equation too. Uh, it's okay for them to want something, and it's okay for them to also change their mind. Uh, uh, that that really, it's 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 them that they have to hold up their own you know values too it's it's honoring themselves and i think if they do that really well um magically they'll bump into some new stuff uh uh you know and and give them good energy moving forward i don't even know if i summarize that it's probably a, a similar to how our whole conversation goes <laughs> finally uh, i want to give you some air time to share anything you feel might be relevant so how is there anything that you're working on that we could help you with? Are there any recommended resources you'd like to direct people to? Anything, anything? I'm actually more interested in helping people uh, work independently, uh, and and so there's this other side project that I've been working on that is. How do we, if we we are driven in this way, where we have to make things and, and you know do things in a certain way, that that really drives us, and and we're struggling to find organizations that kind of allow us to be that. There's still a lot of basics that can be learned or uh, shared with others of how to think about yourself not just as a consultant or a freelancer, but really think about as a tiny business owner to think about the importance of uh, your positioning. How are you slightly different than others? What are you going to be able to do? And, and there's so much in here that is kind of like the cobbler's children go barefoot where, uh, you know, this, this little project that I'm doing called jump ship is where we're just sharing a lot of these samples 
uh, from other ways of working, but how you can apply them to yourself. And I think they're very relevant to somebody who works in-house too, because a lot of what we're sharing is around weird approaches, or not weird, but just uh, easier to digest approaches around marketing yourself or selling or business development. And if you work in-house, that's a lot of what you're doing. It's the same thing. It's the same uh, sales and positioning and finding warm leads. And, and so that's the stuff that uh, uh, I'm mainly focused on there. And we share lots of resources that kind of motivate us. But that whole environment there for the independent worker is just around sampling. Now, Weird Al Yankovic is kind of like our our fake board of director uh, uh, mascot there. And so, yeah. Where do we we're find doing. this? It's uh so the URL is letsjumpship.com. And uh that's you know, you mentioned community, that's primarily what we're gonna be starting out with, more like your circle thing. So it's not a specific course or specific lessons, it's really uh starting out with a, a few sessions per month where we are just gonna do these activities that kind of let us to explore to come back. And and reflect on uh, how we are positioning. How how do we uh, uh, find new ways to uh, uh, find people to work with and 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 make money in different ways and this kind of thing. Super interesting. Um, and I see so many overlaps between what you're doing and the community here. So I'll be very closely monitoring your progress. Um, Ryan, uh, thanks for coming on for the sequel uh i'm sure there will be a trilogy one day uh this was a very interesting episode that took a lot of different turns that uh, i didn't anticipate so that's great um i hope you enjoyed this as well i do uh always mark i i think you and i could talk for hours and cover lots of things and maybe feel like we always have more episodes in us so i i really appreciate you doing this and, and sharing so many voices with the community. It's great. Time for a few closing thoughts. As design professionals, we're often caught up in measuring our success through metrics and quantifiable results. But what Ryan reminded us today is that our value extends beyond numbers by focusing on what we can truly influence and impact within our organizations we can make a meaningful difference, even if it's not always easy to quantify. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please do me one favor. Click the like button if you haven't done so already. It helps me to know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part our ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you're going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.